Blessings, everyone. To God be the glory. We are so thankful and honored that God has allowed us another opportunity to draw closer to him, to study more about who he is and our relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. I want you to make note that uh, we are con continuing to pray for uh, Brother Rudolph Jackson. Uh, let us pray that God will continue to bless him with strength, with uh, steadfastness, and well, God will strengthen his faith and trust in him um, in this difficult, difficult time of the passing of his daughter. We want to continue to pray for uh, Richard Lee and also uh, that God will strengthen him uh, in his faith, in his mind, and, his st and the stability of both of them uh, right now in dealing with uh, the passing of their loved one. And Richard's case, the passing of his mother, and in Brother Rudolph Jackson's case, the passing of his daughter. So church, let us continue to pray. We have much to pray for, and so let us never be a people that cease praying to God or for ourselves and on, the, uh, on behalf of other people. Now church, we have been, we have been looking at compassion, uh, passion, uh, patience, excuse me, uh, Compassion and, 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 and sympathy is what we need to have in our hearts for our dear brothers and sisters going through various tra traumatic situations. But um, we've been dealing with the attribute of the patience of God. And we looked at, and we're going to come back to Psalms chapter 78 because we need to look at uh, uh, some wording in there that would help us uh, come to the understanding of of how patient God really was with Israel and how patient God is with us. It actually should draw you closer to God and it should actually compel you to want to, uh, to, be, to please God and to live for God more in your life, in your daily walk with him, just by knowing how patient he is. Well, in Psalms chapter 78, you remember we looked at some passages of scripture in Psalm 78. I want us to pick up again in verse 38 of Psalm 78 because what we've seen is how patient God is, how compassionate God is with his people, how faithful and loyal God uh, was and is to his people. Even though Israel refused to be loyal uh, and committed to Almighty God. Now I want us to look at verse 38. Well, we'll begin at verse 38. Now notice the Bible says, But he, God, being compassionate, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Now, when he uses the word compassion here, the psalmist, the compassion comes from a Hebrew word which simply means to be merciful, favorable, uh, not given to punishment as often or should be deserved. It implies a forgiving relationship. This word describes the quality or the character of a merciful and compassionate person. It describes the character of a person who tenderly loves another. Uh, and it shows the character uh, and the disposition of sympathy towards another. But notice, this compassion is a compassion that does not give punishment, even though the object of such punishment deserves it. This is, church, our relationship to our God. Our relationship that we have with him through Jesus Christ. That God is patient, his anger is averted from us toward the cross so that even though we deserve the punishment of God, we don't receive such punishment. It's, it signifies how compassionate and how sympathetic God is toward us. 
This is what makes marriage so blessed and fruitful in that both parties, the husband and the wife, when they come together as one union, as one heart, they aren't doing for the other based necessarily on whether or not the person deserves their love. They are doing it because they understand that they are connected to Christ. And because of their connectedness to Christ, they love because Christ loved them. And they understand that his love was not, uh, their behavior was not deserving of his love. Therefore, the wife loves her husband. She respects her husband, not necessarily because he's deserving of it, because she understands the relationship she has with Jesus and vice versa. He loves because, not because she, on this particular day, she's deserving of it. He loves her unconditionally because he understands that Jesus loves him unconditionally. Therefore, it brings about patience with one another. Well, that's what God was to Israel. They refused to, uh, to, to follow God. They forgot the deeds of God. They forgot the blessings of God. But the psalmist says, but he was compassionate. They were rebellious. They were sinful, they were obstinate, but, but God was compassionate. They wouldn't listen to God. They, they, were, uh, they, they committed transgression after transgression, but God was compassionate. They sh shook a rebellious fist at God. They, they, they worshiped idols. They even had Aaron build an idol to worship right after they had come out of Egypt. But God was compassionate. Church, that's the same God that we have today. We don't live for God as we should. We don't speak well of God in our communication and in our, in our language and how we talk to one another. But God is compassionate. We aren't, we aren't as patient with one another as we should be. We can be vindictive when we want to be. We can be hateful when we want to be. We can be, we can be uh, 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 judgmental and uh, uh, full of envy of one another. But God is compassionate toward us. Church, please uh, do not forget who God is and how God operates towards us. I told you in the last study, you have to be careful that you don't, in your human nature, you, 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 you spur out in anger towards someone or dislike towards someone, and you come under the impression that God operates the same way. Church, if God were to operate with envy, with the jealousy that we have, that, uh, with anger and wrath, then church, he would annihilate every one of us. So thank God for his patience. Thank God he has compassion and he looks toward us with sympathy. And he doesn't give us the punishment we so rightly deserve. As a matter of fact, if you notice, one of the words concerning the definition of compassion was favor. They are in a favorable position with God even though they don't deserve it. We are in a favorable position with God. God gives us favor, blesses us with favor even though we don't deserve it. I've often said, church, that God blesses us with spiritual blinders on. He blesses us as if he doesn't have or know reasons as to why he shouldn't bless us. In other words, if God really took into account our sinfulness, our wretchedness, and how we injure him, then we would never be a blessed people. But aren't you glad God blesses us as if he puts blinders on so that he doesn't have reason as to why he shouldn't bless us? 
There are reasons why God shouldn't bless us. You can think of five to ten reasons about your own life and your own walk with God as to why God really shouldn't bless you. But he does so because he's compassionate. He does so in exhibiting his patience with us. Thanks be to God. We have a patient willing to give us compassion instead of justice. Now, the next word in this text, he says, he, God, being compassionate, forgave their iniquity. The word forgave is a Hebrew word to, which means to make amends. It means to cover up. Uh, it gives the provision of reconciliation or atonement, to expiate, uh, and to purge sin. So when God purges sin, when God expiates sin, when he makes atonement for sin, he brings us together. He atones for us. He makes amends of the injury suffered by us. It can only be co it come about when we, when we have a God who is sympathetic, who looks upon us with pity, who is compassionate, so compassionate that, and patient that he is willing, church, to forgive us, to make amends our wrong. Oh, I love this one. To cover up our sins and our nakedness before God. He covers it up. He covers up an offense or a wrong. Uh, it, it is the act that transgressed it. Uh, I'm sorry. It is, it is to expiate or to expunge, to cover for the benefit of, right? It, it, is, it, it, is, it, is for, it is covering up our wrong so that he doesn't bring a charge against us. It is, it is to cover up so, so as not to punish us when necessary. Sure. God forgives us. So when God forgives us, he, he purges sin. He makes amends. He covers up so that he wouldn't have to charge us with the sin. He forgives us, church, and he forgives us completely. But what does he come forgive us of? The iniquity, which is the activity of, of us which becomes crooked or which is crooked. It is wrong. It is an offense. It is the act of transgressing something forbidden, going beyond what is, uh, with what is authorized. And it ignores what is required by God's law or character, whether in thought, feeling, speech, or action. So our iniquity, it also speaks to a depraved mind, a sinful mind, iniquity, crooked action wrongdoing, offenses to God, going beyond what God has, has, has authorized. Going, it, 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 in other words, it's like going into someone is trespass. You've gone beyond the marker. And so the psalmist says God is compassionate even though you've gone beyond. God is compassionate even though you've offended him. God is compassionate, even though you wronged him. God is compassionate, patient, even though your ways are or can be crooked. And he straightens it, he makes amends of our crookedness by forgiving us. He being compassionate, forgave their iniquity, and he did not destroy them or annihilate them. So be glad that God doesn't act off of his anger the way we do. Be glad that God doesn't, doesn't operate from his power and his anger when every time we wrong him. Church, God has Christians all over the world. Could you imagine having to take on the offenses of everyone in the entire world? As a matter of fact, just take the world itself and how offensive the world is to God and his son. 
Yet God sent Jesus to die for us. For God so loved the world, even though the world is offensive, even though the world refuses to come to him, even though the world will turn their backs on him and some Christians, God still so loved the world. He still so loves his church that he was willing to give Jesus for us. But so that he would not annihilate us. All right. Here's the next one. He all, and, and often he, God, restrained his anger. To, he, it, to restrain here means to turn back from, to direct away from something, to turn oneself around. Oh, God, so that he wouldn't destroy them, so that he would show his compassion and show his love and his willingness to forgive them, God turns his anger from them to something else. Or he turns himself from what he sees. Church, realize that's the cross. That judgment, God's justice, was headed directly for mankind. It was headed for you and I. God's wrath, God's anger was directed towards us because of sin. But he sends Jesus. Jesus, while on the cross, is bringing both arms out so that he can bring God and man together, make amends, and it is the justice and the wrath of God that heads to the cross instead of us. The cross, here we are, here's God, here we are, God's anger, God's wrath headed towards us, but the cross steps in between it. Jesus steps in between us and God, brings, averts, and takes on the punishment for, of our iniquity, and he says, bring both parties together. That's reconciliation. And he did it when he turned. He did it when he took his wrath and placed it upon a different object. We were the object of God's wrath, church. And then it says, he did not arouse all of his wrath. Now, now when, we see, when we see that God would destroy them after so long of tolerating and putting up with them, when God finally, when his wrath finally boils over and he has to destroy the Israel, some of the Israelites, notice the psalmist says, but God still did not give or mete out all of his anger. He could have given all of his anger. But he says he withholds it because he's passionate. He's compassionate. He's sympathetic towards us. But then verse 39 says he remembered that we were but flesh. What did he remember? It means to recollect, to bring to, to, bring to mind, to keep in mind, to consider us. He looks at us as fragile creatures. He looks at us as a people uh, like sheep gone astray. He remembers, and that's, a, that's, the, that's the blessing of having a relationship with God in that he remembers exactly who we are. He remembers that we are but flesh. He remembers that we are like the grass and the wind that blows. God remembers all of this, and the blessing is he withholds his wrath. He's doing it with the world. He, God hadn't, God hadn't at least his, his wrath. The psalmist says God, he, he God withheld. He didn't give all, all of the wrath of God. Didn't ball over. Just some of it. And look at what some of the wrath did. Church, God is a powerful God. That's why I love what Nahum would say in Nahum 1 verse 3. Nahum said, God is slow to anger and great in power. Slow to anger because of his power. And I'm glad that we have a God who has the self-control to hold back his power. Rip, let me say it this way. Think of what we just had in office as a president. And everybody 
that, that didn't go along with him, everybody that, that spoke against him, his, in his own human mind and logic, his anger went out towards everybody. He got on and tweeted, got on social media, said whatever he had to say or wanted to say, said whatever he felt he, he was at liberty to say. Didn't matter. His anger was unleashed. Now imagine if God operated the same way. Imagine that, church. I'm thankful that God remembers us. And you ought to be glad God remembers just who you are. God remembers how fragile we are. And, and then God restrains himself. He remembers and he restrains even though we rebel. Watch this. Verse 40 says, how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness. He remembered, he restrained himself, even though we rebelled. What does it mean to rebel? It means to be recalcitrant, rebellious, obstinate, contentious, uh, disobedient. It carries the sense and the idea of contending with God with both hands. It is, a, it is a refusal of what is old or to refuse what is old. We are, in church, as, as, as sinful creatures at best, we are in debt to God. We owe God our lives because of our debt, the sin debt that you and I cannot pay back to God. Yet, when we rebel against God, it is a refusal to give God what we owe. But you can't pay it back. So the only way that you can give God what you owe is by giving your life to Jesus who pays the debt. That's, that's the Christianity we are a part of. That's the Jesus we serve in love. That's the God we now have a relationship with. That Jesus pays the debt we cannot pay. But when we rebel, when we disobey God with a rebellious fist and a consistent, concerted lifestyle to live against the will of God, then we are refusing to give God what we owe him. We owe him our loyalty. We owe him our, our life. We owe him our finances. We, and when we don't do that, we owe him our time. We owe him our talents that he's given us, the gifts he's given us. We owe God all of that. And when you do not give and or live uh, the way God would have you, when you, when you have re rebelled and you are determined to live a contentious life with God, to shake both fists and hands in contention against God, you are refusing to give God what he owes. But remember what the text says. But he is compassionate. Yeah. Now, they rebel. We rebel against him in the wilderness. Here's the next word. And grieved him in the desert. Oh, the word grieve simply means to hurt to offend, to injure, or to bring sorrow. Church, have you ever stopped to think about how your behavior affects God? Have you ever stopped to think of, of uh, before engaging in an ungodly conversation with someone, how that injures God, how it sorrows God, how it hurts God? Have you ever stopped to think that some of the things we engage in, some of the things we do uh, personally and toward or uh, at one another, have you ever stopped to think of how that bothers God? The text says they grieved God in the desert. God continued to provide for them, but God's provision isn't good enough. Church, I, I'm going to say this, that I can understand what Moses went through. I understand how Moses struck the rock. I really do. I understand because when you lead God's people, not everybody, but it just seems apparent that there are many of God's
God's people who have forgotten that God is patient with them. And they have, and they, we complain, we murmur, we gripe about everything, we accuse the man of God of everything. And they, the Israel did the same thing to Moses. And when you, and doing it to Moses, they grieved God. And they, they actually angered God. Church, that's, that's how we are from time to time. You've got to be careful of your mindset. You've got to be careful. And I want you to be more, more uh, uh, discerning in the things that you do, what you engage in, how you engage in it. And I want you to be, I want it to be a, I want it to be a pressure point in your life to remember or to keep in mind how what I do affects God. I want you to bear, bear that in mind. So it grieves God. It hurts God. It offends him. It sorrows God. It pains God, which is what we're going to see in the next word. They're pretty much connected again and again. They tempted God. Put God to the test. It means to, it, it means to test something in order to ascertain the nature of something. Including, it could be including imperfections, faults, or qualities. So Israel often, whenever they complained about this manner, they tempted God. In other words, they were testing God because they didn't quite believe in the qualities of God. It spoke against the character of God. It spoke against the, against the intentions of God for them. And they are saying to God, God, I'm not sure you are who you are. I'm not sure you're capable of doing it. Remember the language we read in the last study? They said, who will give us food? Will God prepare a table in this wilderness for us? Matter of fact, it's better we go back to Egypt. Look at how they tempted God. Church, sometimes we think just like Israel. Sometimes, church, we are no different from the Israelites in our where waywardness, our lack of faith in God, our disobedience to God. We are, we are close cousins to Israel. So it grieved him. They grieved him in the desert. And again and again, they tempted God and pained to afflict, to grieve, wound, trouble. Bring anguish to provoke. They, they pained God. They did not remember his power. The day when he redeemed them from the adversary. Now, in, in, in notice, church, they didn't, re they, they didn't remember rebellious. They were too busy complaining. They were too busy looking at their problems and not the problem solver. They were too busy focusing on what they didn't have and instead of focusing on the one who could provide everything that they needed. They missed all of that and they forgot the power, his power. And when he redeemed them from the adversary. Look at that. God remembers, God restrains, God redeems. Even though we rebel. So when he performed his signs in Egypt and his marvels in the in the field of Zoan and turn their rivers to blood, their streams they could not drink. He says they forgot everything God did in Egypt. As a matter of fact, they forgot what God was doing through Moses. They didn't want to. They didn't want to accept it. They didn't want to live by it. But they and they failed to realize that God was working through Moses. He sent Moses to them. But they wouldn't receive it. Well, look at uh, look at verse fifty-five. God drove out the nations before them, apportioned them for an inheritance by measurement, and made the tribes of Israel dwell in their tents. Yet they tempted and rebelled against God the Most High, and did not keep His testimony. Testimonies. They turned back and acted treacherously like their fathers and they turned aside like a treacherous bull for they provoked him with their high places when it talks about the high places 
it, the high places were considered where they worshiped the idols, where the, where the Gentiles or the pagans would go up and worship. So he says, they tempted God, they aroused him with jealousy, with their graven images. They worship God. I mean, idol. And, and part of that, part of that, let's be fair to Israel, a good part of that was because they had learned to worship the way the Egyptians had worshipped. They had come accustomed and acquainted with all of the idol gods that Israel, uh, that the Egyptians had become accustomed to worshipping and acquainted with. This is why God shows such mighty power in dealing with in, when he sends the plagues. The plagues wasn't simply to harm the Egyptians, but it was to actually show that their idol gods, the sun god, the god of the rivers, the god of blood, all of those gods were nothing in comparison to the God Almighty. And that's why God would send those plagues. It was to attack the Egyptians' gods. But then it was to help Israel see that there was no God like Jehovah God. Yet their problem was they refused to allow God to purge Egypt out of their hearts. It pained God. They, aff they afflicted God. And so I want us to look at one other, one last scripture. I want us to look at how God, well, let me say it this way. Let's look at another example of how patient God is toward us. Look at, look at Ezekiel, come to Ezekiel chapter 20. Look at Ezekiel chapter 20. Now, the elders come before God to inquire of the Lord, to question God, right? Uh, but Ezekiel in verse 2 says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel and say to them, Thus said the Lord, Do you come to inquire of me? As I live, declares the Lord, I will not be inquired by you or of, inquired of by you. Will you judge them? Will you judge them, son of man? Make them know the abominations of their fathers. Say to them, thus said the Lord God, on the day when I chose Israel and swore to the descendants of the house of Jacob and made myself known to them in the land of Egypt, when I swore to them, saying, I am the Lord your God. And on that day I swore to them to bring them out from the land of Egypt into a land that I selected for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. I said to them, cast away each of you the detestable things of his eyes. Do not defile yourselves with the idols. Here it is, the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me and were not willing to listen to me. They did not cast away the detestable things of their eyes, but did they, but nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Right? Now, they were, then the Bible says, then I resolved to pour out my wrath on them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I acted for the sake of my name, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations among whom they live, in whom sight I made myself known to them by bringing them out of the land of Egypt. God says the only reason I, I chose at this time not to destroy them and not to allow my anger to consume them was because I had to uphold my name. Do you not know you are still here because of the name of God? Do you not know that God has not destroyed you? God has allowed you to live through some stuff. God has allowed you to go through some stuff that you caused in your own life so because he wants to have his name honored. God has not punished us as we so rightly deserve because God wants to honor his name. Because if God were to do what he really was capable of doing, then how in the world would the sinner come to believe in God? If, if, if God's people can't show forth the power of God in, in our own lives, then we aren't any good to the world. God says, 
I acted for my namesake. I restrained myself for my namesake. I kept back my anger for my namesake. Church, it wasn't because you outwitted God. It wasn't because you were smarter and more clever than God. Now, no, you, you lasted this long in spite of what you did and are doing because of his namesake. He says, I gave them my statute, verse 11, informed them of my ordinances by which if a man observed them, he will live. I also, I gave my Sabbath to, to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. But the, but the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes. They rejected my ordinances by which if a man observes them, he will live. And my Sabbath, they greatly profaned. Then I resolved to pour out my wrath on them in the wilderness to annihilate them. But I acted for my name's sake, that it, shot, sh that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations before those sight, uh, whose sight I had brought them out. Also I swore to them in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all the lands. Drop down to verse 17. Yet my eye spared them rather than destroying them, and I did not cause their annihilation in the wilderness. Church, every blessing you have is so that the world will see the power of God in you. The reason you, can, you are living in spite of the bad decisions you've made is so that God can get glory from your life, so that the world can see that there is hope. Because if I can make it, if you can make it, in spite of the things you've done, then it gives hope to a dying world that there is life with Christ. Well, let me read a little bit more. Verse 18 says, I said to their children, in the wilderness, do not walk in the statues of your fathers or keep their ordinances or defile yourselves with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statues. Keep my ordinances and observe them. Sanctify my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. But the children rebelled against me. They did not walk in my statutes, nor were they careful to observe my ordinances by which if a man observes them, he will live. They profane my Sabbaths, so I resolved to pour out my wrath on them and accomplish my anger against them in the wilderness. But... I withdrew my hand and acted for my namesake, that it should not be profane in the sight of the nations in whose sight I brought them out. God says, I brought Israel out of Egypt so that the nations around them would see I am God. I'm telling you, church, every blessing, every blessing you have it isn't to show off what kind of car you drive. It isn't to show off how big your house is. It isn't to show that you got money in the bank. That is not why God blesses us. God blesses us so that the world will see there are better blessings, lasting blessings, eternal blessings in Christ and in God. That's why you are blessed. That's why you have peace. Because the world is void of peace. That's why you have joy. The world seeks to manufacture joy, but it doesn't last. That's why you have hope. This world outside of Christ is in a hopeless situation. Everything we have in Christ through God, through, by God through Christ is a blessing for the world to see and acknowledge that God is real. Pray with me. Father God, I'm thankful for your patience. I'm thankful for your compassion. I'm thankful for your willingness to forgive us of our sins. Even though we rebel, even though we, we fail to remember your blessings, even though, Father, we transgress your law and your will, Father, we are sinful at best. But, Father, may this realization strengthen our resolve in you and our faith in you to live committed lives to appreciate what you do for us, to love what you've accomplished at the cross for us. Because, Father, you are a compassionate God. You are a great and awesome God. And thank you, Father, for withholding your power and your anger from our sinfulness. We thank you, dear God, that the cross stands.
stood as a deflector of your wrath and your justice. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for Jesus' blood that, that shed for us and washes and expunges, expiates our sin. Father, we pray and ask your blessings on all of those who are on our prayer list, all of those who have lost their loved ones this past year, this, within this year and even last year. All who are still struggling, Father, to, to make ends meet. Many have lost jobs. Many are still trying to recoup and regain their bearings. Father, we pray that you will bless them in such a mighty way. Father, help us to come to know and to remember and never forget that you are God and you are worthy to be. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father. Bless us throughout the remainder of the week. It's in Jesus' name we pray.